It's getting <laughs> early or late, Mr. Speaker. Whatever. I'm not sure which. So um, I had, do have a few questions for the proponent of the bill as Proceed. amended through you, Mr. Speaker. I've been reading extensively in the public hearing testimony, and I noticed there were a number of items submitted by not-for-profits. I'm looking specifically at testimony submitted by John Catalan, who's the executive director of the Connecticut Alliance of YMCA's, and he points out the financial impact of this proposed bill. I, I'm looking at the fiscal note, and I, he notes that the uh, $12 per hour minimum wage, the financial impact would be $2.6 and the compression impact at $12 per hour would be almost $5 million. At $15 per hour, it would be $4.5 million. I do see that there needs to be increased funding because they are supplying daycare through Care for Kids. Does the fiscal note reflect that compression wage increase funding? I'm, I don't know if the good representative can hear me, Mr. Speaker. I was just thinking that myself. Thank you. Through you, Mr. Speaker. And I'd be happy to repeat my question if the uh, good representative had difficulty hearing. Representative Porter, were you able to hear it? Through you, Mr. Speaker, uh, I thank the good gentlelady for asking the question. I did hear her, and I am prepared to answer. Uh, she's speaking about wage compression, if I'm not mistaken, and that is not explicitly required under this amendment. Through you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Cheeseman. Th th I thank her for her questions, and my, my actual question referred to the uh, note from the Office of Fiscal Analysis. Does their forecast of increased cost to the state include that wage compression through you, Mr. Speaker? Representative Porter? Through you, Mr. Speaker, it is not explicitly required under this amendment, and I believe that that is something that will be addressed as we go through uh, the appropriation budget process. Through you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Cheeseman. So if I want to understand correctly, the fiscal note, as it does not address that wage compression, which obviously is something that will be if felt by these not-for-profits would result in even greater costs to the state. Is that not correct? Through you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Porter. Through you, Mr. Speaker. I cannot predict that. Through you. Representative Cheeseman. I, I appreciate the uh, good gentle lady's discretion in this, but I think if we look at the math, there will be increased costs. I do know I attended a uh, early childhood learning seminar at Three Rivers Community College where the executive director of the Riverfront Children's Center was present and she indicated the cost of the proposed $15 minimum wage, including the wage compression, would amount to a $300,000 addition to her annual overheads. She was very upset by this. She stated that she could not in good conscience pass on this cost to her low-income parents. She was thrilled to have them be better off, but she didn't see how this increased cost in terms of her overheads would allow her to continue to deliver the high-quality childcare to carry out her mission, absent increased appropriations from the state or an increase to the cost of her parents. I myself run a not-for-profit. We, we have received no local, state, or federal funding. If I were to have to go to that $15 minimum wage, it would add fifteen dollars to $20,000 a year to my overheads. Now, I have three full-time employees, including myself, and 10 part-time employees. Seven out of 10 of them are teachers who are taking time off or retired teachers. They are not the sole support of their households, and I pay them what I can. We start at $12 an hour. After 90 days, we go up to $13 an hour, and I try and raise everyone's wage a dollar a year after that. We also are a member of Museums for All. Anyone presenting an EBT or SNAP card is admitted for a dollar per person for up to six people. Our ordinary admission is eight dollars. 
we want to make my museum accessible for everyone. That's part of our mission, to provide a safe, caring, inclusive environment where children can learn and play and discover. We offer subsidized military memberships. Any active duty military based on rank has a heavily subsidized membership. Family memberships are ordinarily $85 a year. An E6, the lowest enlisted rank, if I'm not mistaken, can have that family membership for $45 a year. That's unlimited admission. I don't know many places where a family of up to six can go on an unlimited basis for $45 a year. If I have to find that extra fifteen dollars or $20,000, do I get out of Museums for All? Do I raise my entrance fee of $8 per person? Do I knock on more doors? Sure, I'll do what I have to. But this is going to be a burden to me, and it's going to be a burden to all the other not-for-profits who submitted testimony. So accordingly, Mr. Speaker, the clerk has in his hands an amendment, LCO number 8204, and I ask that he call that amendment and I be granted leave of the chamber to summarize. The clerk is indeed in possession of LCO number 8204, which will be designated House Amendment Schedule. D, the gentlewoman is asked to leave the chamber summarizes their objection, hearing none. Representative Cheeseman. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, and I'm I, I, I skipped, I skipped yes. a piece. Will the clerk please I call will. the amendment that will be designated House mm -hmm. Amendment Schedule D? House Amendment Schedule D, LCO number 8204, offered by Representative Claritas, Representative Candelora et al. Now, Representative Cheeseman. Th thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the, the amendment is a very simple one. Uh, after the last section, you adds uh, this provision, uh, increases to the minimum fair wage on and after October 1st, 2019, shall not apply to employers that are not-for-profit entities, not-for-profit hospitals, and institutions of higher education. And I urge adoption of the amendment, and when the vote is taken, I ask that it be taken by roll, please, Mr. Questions Speaker. Questions on adoption of House Amendment Schedule D, and when the vote is taken, it will be taken by roll call. Would you care to remark further, ma'am? Yes, I would. I think this rapid increase in the minimum wage for many not-for-profits represents an existential crisis. Not-for-profits are devoted to their mission. They care no less than any other organization about the well-being of their employees and for the fulfillment of their mission, be it a children's museum like me, be it a boys and girls club, such as was referenced by Representative Betts, was it my Riverfront Children's Center or the YMCA's? We need to, one, trust them to pay their employees what is fair and what they can, and not create a burden on them that may cause them to have to forfeit that mission to which they are dedicated. So with the well-being of these not-for-profits and their employees and the people we serve, I urge everyone in this chamber to adopt this amendment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The amendment is rejected. Will your remark further on the bill is amended? Mr. Speaker, I have a few more questions for the proponent, if I may. Representative Cheeseman, you have the floor, madam. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Um, through you, Mr. Speaker, I see that there is a four and a half year phase in for this minimum wage. Through you, Mr. Speaker, can you explain where, what the genesis of this four and a half year period was? Through you. Representative Porter. Through you, Mr. Speaker, we actually landed there because we were trying to accommodate those that have requested that we extend the years that we do this minimum wage. We started out at three years in our original bill. We went from three to four, which was reflected in the governor's bill. And then we went another six months through you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Cheeseman. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And were there any other states that have recently implemented a minimum wage at whose time scale you looked at through you, Mr. Speaker? Representative Porter. Yes, Mr. Speaker, through you. Representative Cheeseman. Through you, Mr. Speaker. May I ask which those states were? Through you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Porter. I would have to get back to the good lady on that. Through you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Cheeseman. Thank you. Through you, Mr. Speaker. And I just wondered, and I will look forward to hearing from the proponent, uh, I know Massachusetts recently implemented that. They chose a five-year period. Uh, Oregon has implemented that. That actually started in 2016 and will finish in 2023. And in Oregon, they actually have three different uh, minimum wage levels. One is a standard. One is a Portland Metro, which deals with large urban areas, and one is a uh, non-urban county. Uh, through you, Mr. Speaker, was such a scale considered in Connecticut? Through you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Porter. Through you, Mr. Speaker, I'm not sure if that was taken into consideration when we looked at the other states. Through you. Representative Cheeseman. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It just occurs to me that even in our very small state, nowhere near as large as Oregon, we do have large differentials in cost of living. Obviously, the cost of living in Fairfield County is not going to be the same as in Wyndham or Toland. And it would occur to me it would go far to accommodate the concerns, particularly of small employers and not-for-profits, if we looked at some sort of geographic wage scale. Um, I through you, Mr. Speaker, is the uh, proponent of the bill familiar with Maryland's recent wage increase? Through you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Porter. Not off the top of my head. Through you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Cheeseman. Thank you. Through you, Mr. Speaker. In Maryland, their minimum wage, again, is going up over a period of six years and they actually differentiate between employers with more than 15 employees and employers with fewer than 15 employees, was such a level of employment looked at when considering this implementation of the increased minimum wage? Through you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Porter. Through you, Mr. Speaker, I do not know but I'm assuming that the good representative will tell us, as she just did with the last question she posed to me. Through you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Cheeseman. I, I wish I could, but I was actually asking the good representative if a similar way of scaling the minimum wage increase was considered in Connecticut, that we would have one scale for employers with more than 15 employees and one scale for employers with fewer than employees. And I was asking if that had been considered in Connecticut. Through you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Porter. Through you, Mr. Speaker, no. Representative Cheeseman. Thank you. And, uh, oh, I see that there is not a differential for apprentices. Uh, can I ask why that was not considered? Through you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Porter. Through you, Mr. Speaker, not sure. Representative Cheeseman. Uh, through you, Mr. Speaker. The reason I ask, and I, people in the chamber will probably have been bored at how often I tout my great Eastern Workforce Investment Board, but in their manufacturing pipeline initiative, I know of one employer in particular hires pre-apprentices at $13 an hour. After a period of 18 weeks, they go up to $18 an hour and then $20 an hour. When I asked him what would happen if this $15 minimum wage were uh, implemented, he explained he would have no choice but to hire fewer pre-apprentices. And hence my question, whether or not the effect on our manufacturing pipeline projects and our apprenticeship programs was taken into account when this bill was drafted. Through you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Porter. Through you, Mr. Speaker, that sounded like a statement. So if there was a question, could you please have the good gentlewoman uh, Repeat it. Thank you. Representative you. Cheeseman, can you rephrase your question in a way that's clear to the uh, proponent of the bill? Certainly, Mr. Speaker. Was the 
possible impact on our apprenticeship programs taken into account when considering the increase in the minimum wage? Through you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Porter. Through you, Mr. Speaker, no. Representative Cheeseman. Thank you. Uh, I also have a uh, plumbing and uh, HVAC contractor in my area, and he is mandated by the state to start his journeymen and apprentices at 1010 an hour. After 18, eight, 8,000 hours, they go up to $20 an hour. Were the needs of people in the skilled trades like that taken into account when this legislation was drafted? Through you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Porter. Through you, Mr. Speaker, could the uh, good gentlewoman please repeat the question through you? Representative Cheeseman, please Sir, repeat the question, madam. Certainly. Um, a, an HVAC contractor in my district explained that his entry-level employees are mandated by the state to be hired at the minimum wage. They start at 10.10 currently an hour. After 8,000 hours, their wage goes up to $20 an hour, and after that, climbs pretty quickly. He, too, stated this would present a real hardship when it came to hiring. And my question was, were those state-mandated requirements with regard to the hiring of skilled workers taken into account when this legislation was drafted? Through you, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. Representative Porter. Through you, Mr. Speaker. Not sure. Representative Cheeseman. Thank you. And I believe that concludes my questions, Mr. Speaker. I do have a few comments. I find the possible effect that this is going to have on the not-profits very worrying. I would feel that way even if I were not running a not-for-profit. I find the possible effect this is going to have on our apprenticeship programs, on our HVAC contractors like the one in my region, very concerning. But what I think we're not really addressing with this is why we are even having this conversation. The rest of the country, in many states, the fight for 15 is gone away because the economies are so buoyant and so thriving that employers are forced because of shortage of workers, because of the need to compete for these skilled laborers to offer packages well in excess of $15 an hour. I'm looking at a Bloomberg piece dated from May last year, and its title was, This is what record low unemployment looks like in America. And they looked at Portland, Maine, Marietta, Georgia, and Ames, Iowa. And in all these small cities, they found robust hiring. Lore Bakari, a 36-year-old Nigerian immigrant, was homeless and had little marketable work. A federally funded not-for-profit found trained him. He earns 40,000 annually with health care and good benefits. Cobb Works, a call center has been moving up. Companies are supplying higher wages and benefits that exceed anything that we see in this state. 100% of employee health insurance premiums paid up from 75% allows employees to work from home four or five days a week. Yeah, a call center allows its employees to call from home, and every five years offers a sabbatical for its workers. This is what we could have in Connecticut if we didn't keep doing things to discourage workers and business. And I have heard references to people struggling on the minimum wage. I've also heard references to businesses who will struggle to deal with that minimum wage. Businesses are not faceless. Businesses are run by people. I think of three women in particular in my district. Wanda Hatch, who runs that HVAC company in my district. Cindy Leitner, who owns a small retail shop. Terry Smith, who owns a greenhouse and gardening company. They are the face of small business. These are women who get up 
every day and bet everything they own that it's still going to be there at the end of the day. They treat their employees well. They may go weeks taking no wages so they can pay their workers, they can pay the state of Connecticut, they can pay the federal government, they can pay their suppliers, and they can keep the lights on. I care about people who aren't doing well on the minimum wage, but I care equally about the men and women, and the women in particular, who do put everything on the line every day to keep those doors open, to keep those employees working. I bend over backwards at my museum to do what I can, to pay my employees as much as I can, to be flexible in their work hours, to let them work from home when they can. I am not Simon Legree, and my constituents who own businesses are not J.P. Morgan. They are not sitting at home clipping dividend coupons. They are working to advance this state, and it is our job, I feel, as a legislature to work with them to create the environment where we aren't having to have this conversation about forcing companies that may not have the financial wherewithal to pay, pay their employees wages that are going to drive them out of business. And as I said, we wouldn't even be having this conversation if we had the kind of robust economy that our surrounding states, Massachusetts, which everyone likes to cite, which has regained 300% of the jobs it's lost in the recession. So I look forward to hearing the rest of the debate, but I think we have to remember that the business owners who are going to bear the burden are not the Aetnas, not the Anthems. They are the R&W Heating. They are the Smith's Acres. They are the Smoochy Bird in my town. They are the not-for-profits like the YWCA, like the Boys and Girls Clubs of Bristol. And we have to keep them in mind because without them, even those minimum wage jobs won't be there. So I thank you for your indulgence, Mr. Speaker, and I will not be supporting this bill. Thank you.